All right, thanks. Uh, let me share my screen so I can get my presentation going. Hey, Amy, can you just give me a... Yep, yep you can see that. I cool. can see, yeah. All right, cool. Um, I am... I'm Niall. Hi, I'm going to kick off uh, this session. I've got Martin sitting in the background here as well, who's uh, available to jump in when I get something wrong or uh, to help me out with questions at the end. Um, but he'll, he'll kind of be sitting silently in the background, hopefully, for most of this, and I'll get everything right first try. Um, right, like we said, uh, the session today is about uh, 3D tiles and QGIS. Um, Oops, and I'm going to start off a little bit in the background first, just to kind of lead into this, and then I'll have a live demo, you know, fingers crossed live demo, um, and then some questions and some sort of future stuff at the end of this session. Um, first up, I'm going to jump to the kind of spoiler, the end, uh, the end credits, if you want. Um, and that's to say that all of this stuff that we'll be demoing and talking about today is available in the upcoming QGIS 3.34 release, which is due out in a matter of a couple of weeks. Um, but it's also available in the nightly beta releases as of a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago almost. Um, so certainly if you go in and you download a beta release of QGIS 3.34, uh, you can test this and start giving feedback and uh, having fun. All right, uh, so this work came about because of a Cesium ecosystem grant. So Cesium are an organization who are behind the, the 3D tiles specification and a lot of the software relating to 3D tiles. Um, and they've launched a grant program for organizations and for projects to kind of um, contribute to the Cesium ecosystem. Um, and so we saw this opportunity and we were like, this is great. You know, we think that uh, QG should be able to consume this data, uh, which will work together on this one. So um, the project is a joint effort between LATRA, and that's Martin kind of sitting in the background there again, uh, and myself from North Road. Um, and we've, you know, we've done a lot of these kind of joint projects in the past. So uh, if you're familiar with um, the, like the point cloud support in QGIS, this kind of came about as a joint project, um, much the same as this Cesium work has. A uh, bit of credits here. So some of the background um, initial work was done by Auslandia. Um, a lot of the prior work is based on our point cloud stuff that the that we've run past crowdfunding for. Um, and also full credit goes out to the, this tiny GLTF library that we rely on heavily for opening the or for viewing the content in uh, the 3D tiles. So this isn't the cutest thing. It's a kind of a external project, but they've been really good and really helpful. Um, and of course, Cesium, like massive credit to Cesium. Um, but again, this is, this the Freddy tiles is actually based really heavily off the point cloud work that we've done in the past. So um, in the past couple of years, if you're familiar with the QGIS project and, and how the development has been going, uh, Lutcher and North Road have run a crowdfunding. It's almost been a yearly event for the last um, maybe four years. Um, to, to kind of extend QGIS 3D and mostly focusing on the point cloud support. Um, and fortunately, there's a lot in common between 3D tiles and point clouds, um, especially if you kind of look at the, the EPT format for point clouds. There's a pretty big sort of conceptual overlap between that EPT point cloud format and how 3D tiles work. So it meant that we could kind of just take a lot of this stuff that we've done in the past for for, for point clouds and a lot of that kind of knowledge that we've built up um, and reuse it for the 3D tiles. Um, so the development was done by myself. Um, I was focused mostly on the 2D side of things and kind of the, the general infrastructure about um, cesium tiles. And then Martin, I wasn't sure which picture Martin most wanted, so I just grabbed his GitHub one, this pixelated cartoon thing. He doesn't look like that in reality. Um, Martin was doing all the 3D side of things. Um, the other thing I want to say is every time we get an opportunity to do a project like this, so like with the point cloud work and with these new cesium tiles, um, we always treat it as an opportunity to fix other bits in QGIS as well. So it's not always about just looking at point clouds or just looking at 3D tiles. It's about um, you know, how we can improve the whole of QGIS. So, uh, 
in this case, this was another opportunity to do that kind of thing. And so um, as part of the work, we, we fixed up some of the limitations in the 3D scenes. So things like the, these sort of fixes about memory handling in 3D scenes benefit uh, point clouds and, and other large 3D scenes as well. So it's kind of not just limited the benefits of this to the 3D tiles, but it also kind of bleeds out into a whole lots of different parts of QGIS. Um, even things like this kind of stuff, you know, just sort of paper cut stuff that uh, a project like this gives us the opportunity to, to, to touch on. Um, and then strangely enough as well, every time we, we get an opportunity to introduce a whole new layer type into the QGIS code, so this in this case we've got a whole new layer type that is tiled scene layers, it actually gives us an opportunity again to... Hey, am I still here? Did... Yep, you're still here. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> so <laughs> somebody, just, somebody just pinged in my headphones and I was like, I hope that wasn't my connection. Oh, no, right someone now. just uh, um, popped into the meeting. <laughs> um, oh, good. Yeah, anyway, so every time we introduce a new layer type, like the point cloud layers, or in this case, the, the tiled scene layers, it gives us an opportunity to look at some of the kind of general layer handling stuff in QGIS and work out better ways to do that and to kind of um, rework that to get rid of duplicate code. So it's kind of like a, a little bit of a unexpected benefit is introducing a new um, framework into QGIS actually gives us an opportunity to cut a whole lot of code and sort of condense it and rework it. Um, so we see stuff like this, like where 1500 lines of code were dropped, 900 were introduced and sort of like it's in some cases it's like a net loss of code and it actually simplifies other bits of the project. So it's kind of like an extra win that bleeds out. Um, this is me just kind of amusing as well. It's like, uh, if we look at the, the history of QGIS, it sort of started off with just vector layers and raster layers. And for a long time, that was the, the, the two layer types that were solely available in QGIS. And then over time, we, we saw the introduction of like the mesh layer type in QGIS 3.2, uh, vector tiles in 3.14. And then this is kind of like the, the pace of new layer types and completely new kind of data formats getting introduced into QGIS seems to be accelerating. So we see like point clouds and annotation layers, and now we've got tiled scene layers. Um, and it kind of makes me wonder is like, you know, what's next? What's the next big uh, new type of spatial data that QGIS doesn't even touch at the moment that's going to come in? Um, all right. So, what are 3D tiles? So, uh, focusing on the cesium 3D tiles, it's a standard based format. It's an OGC community standard um, where the content from a scene is split up into tiles. So conceptually, conceptually, it's a little bit like vector tiles. So vector tiles uh, has this concept where you have tiles of different levels of detail and the the more you zoom out, you get just a generalized simplified view of that data. So the data is kind of condensed down into just its smallest possible representation that looks good at that scale. And then there's, the more you zoom in, you get just um, smaller parts of the earth but at greater levels of detail. So that's kind of how a vector tiles layer works. Um, cesium 3D tiles are a, a similar kind of concept but extended into three dimensions. Um, so Instead of a 2D plane, like we see with the, two, the vector tiles, we're looking at 3D bounding box, boxes. So you have a bounding volume, and then as you zoom into that bounding volume, the content gets refined into sort of more and more detail the closer in you get to it. Um, a interesting thing about the 3D tiles, uh, the season 3D tiles, is that the, the bounding boxes for these features, they don't follow like a regular structure. Um, so in contrast, if we looked at something like uh, a point cloud, which uses like an oak tree structure, uh, everything is nice and it sort of splits into half um, at each level of detail. So it's a really structured kind of um, grid based approach. Same with vector tiles, it's all uh, like on a fixed grid. So each um, tile basically doubles and halves in size geographic area. Um, 3D tiles don't work that way. They have a a different format where it's more freeform. And basically the more content is in one part of that tile, um, we see the bounding boxes kind of focus in on that area. So the, the bounding boxes are actually like defined by the data structure itself, um, which makes a lot of sense for the, the delivery of the data. It uh, means it can, 
you're not sort of wasting tiles on content on areas that have low content, um, but it does make the code and the kind of logic a lot more complex. It's a bit of a trade-off. Um, the other thing that the cesium 3 d tiles have uh, is this concept of tile refinement. So there's there's two different um, approaches that tiles can take here. So one is that as you as you zoom into a tile, you initially get this simplified zoomed out view. Um, and it can be that when you zoom in, the tile gets refined and the content gets replaced with like a, a more detailed view of that of that area. Um, or alternatively, you have a um, an addition process where as you zoom in, it keeps the content from the, the generalized zoomed out tile, but it adds more content. So you get like the big buildings when you're zoomed out and the closer when you get, you start getting little houses and stuff pop into view as you get to that sort of level of detail. Uh, I should say that cesium is just one form of, of these tiled scene layers. There are alternative um, formats. Um, they aren't supported in QGIS yet. So QGIS 3.34 um, has support for cesium tiles only, um, but the code was written so that this could potentially be extended in future to other formats if the, the need arises. All right, um, where do you get this data? So this is kind of like a, the big question of like, okay, there's all this stuff, new stuff in QGIS, how do I actually use it? If you're lucky, um, your local government or your, your country government might have a something like a digital twin project where they've already captured uh, a bunch of 3D data for an area and they've published that. And chances are, if they've done that, it'll be in that cesium format. So uh, speaking for myself, I'm quite lucky. The Australian government has actually got quite a lot of detailed kind of 3D models like this that you can get and they're in the, the cesium format. Um, but the, the availability will depend on the the region and you know the data custodians and who's in charge of the kind of spatial data for that area. Uh, you can also get all of the Google Earth data in cesium 3D tiles. So this is a, a relatively recent um, announcement that came out of uh, a partnership between cesium and Google Maps. Um, but if you if you go in, you sign up to the Google Maps API and you get an API key, then you can actually hook all of the Google Earth tiles into, into your QGIS and use that cesium 3D tiles specification to actually get that data. So that's pretty exciting because it, obviously the Google Earth um, 3D data is almost global. Like it's got a pretty good geographic reach um, and some really detailed data if it's in a uh, populated center. Uh, another source of 3D tiles is Cesium, the Cesium Ion platform. So this is Cesium's um, kind of data hosting uh, service where you can push up 3D data sets and they will generate the 3D tiles for you and host it. Um, and so that's a, another kind of bucket where you can find this kind of data. Um, and actually another cool thing is that if you, if you use Open Drone Map and you're kind of doing your own aerial imagery and um, point clouds using open drone map one of the outputs that that open drone map gives you is the 3d tiles textured mesh so you can actually get it from your flights and then pull that into QGIS now uh, this is another question that came up a couple of times when we were going through this process uh, people would ask you know why do we want to get these cesium 3d tiles into QGIS what's the big you know, what's the benefit there? A um, couple of things that, a couple of reasons I want to point out. So first off, it's a it's a spatial data source. Like this data is kind of intrinsically geographic. Uh, if you look at the Google Earth tiles, the Google Earth, um, you know, building data sets and that, it's a definitely a spatial uh, data format and there's valuable data that sits in there. So anytime I see a spatial data source, I want to be able to get it into QGIS and put it alongside all my other spatial data sources. So I don't want it to be kind of siloed away, having to view it in a separate application or a separate website and have it as a totally different sort of beast to all my standard vector data and raster data and all that. I want to be able to get it all and QGIS being that sort of central common point that lets me pull all those data sources together and uh, overlay them and compare them and such. Um, but another really big benefit 
that I see of having 3D tiles and QGIS is that these are fantastic for base maps for a 3D view. So just as a kind of example, I had a, I had a client ask me um, a couple of months back, they were like, we, were, we need to make a 3D flyover of this um, road, uh, potential road design, um, and we want to use QGIS 3D for it, but it kind of looks boring at the moment because all we see is the 3D, that the highway on top of an open street map flat plane. And they're like, how can we, you know, how can we make this look a bit more exciting? My answer now would be pull in the, pull in the Google Earth tiles as a cesium 3D tile set and then put that in the background. So then you'd see that uh, 3D design of the, the of the bridge sitting on top of all that great sort of base map background stuff. And it would actually give you the context and that uh, visual interest in that um, animation they were making. All right, demo time. Uh, this is where I get nervous because it's a live demo um, using a beta version of QGIS. So, you know, fingers crossed this will be, this will be nice to me. Uh, so this, right now I'm looking at a nightly release of QGIS 3.34. So, um, tagged here as QGIS 3.33. So this will eventually kind of a couple of weeks time be tagged as QGIS 3.34 with a version you get from the QGIS website. But you can just download the nightly now and you'll see the same thing as I'm seeing on my screen right now. Um, when I fire up the new version of QGIS, there's a bunch of extra buttons and menu items and things relating to these um, cesium tiled scenes. Uh, the easiest way to get to it is through this data source manager. So this being the kind of standard way in QGIS to add new data sources. So if I bring up the data source manager, uh, you'll see that I've got a new entry on the left-hand side here, alongside all my mesh and point cloud and all that for scene. So this is where we get to uh, the 3D tiles, so the, the tagged as scenes in here. Um, and I can go in here and I can either add one from a file. So if I've got one that's stored locally, like say if I've pulled it out of Open Drone Map and I've downloaded that 3D textured mesh from uh, Open Drone Map flight, I could just point that across to the um, to the sort of data set JSON file on my computer. Uh, otherwise, I set it up as a service and I can go new new Cesium 3D tiles connection. And then basically, I just need the the uh, URL of the the tile set JSON file. Uh, the task at Jason. Um, so I've got a bunch here I've already set up for different sources. Uh, these are the ones from that Australian government uh, digital twin project. So if I have a look at one of these, it's basically just a a URL that's pointing to this sort of root tile set JSON file that defines um, the pre tiles tiles uh, data set. Um, so I can either pick one out here, just like my WMSs or Postgres layers or such. Uh, alternatively, I also see them in my QGIS browser panel. So this browser over here has got a new entry for scenes. And if I open this one up, I see all the, the scenes I've kind of previously defined there. So I'm gonna just pull in this one here. Um, and what we see here is the, the 2D view of this data. So these, 3D tile scenes are kind of an inherently 3D data set, but the you know the the core of QGIS is still very heavily based around this 2D map view. Um, let me put an OpenStreetMap in the background here just to give some context. Um, so we thought it was really important to make sure that uh, these 3D tiles weren't missing from our 2D map views, like we still need to be able to see them in there, see that sort of geographic coverage of them um, and be able to see them overlaid with my other data sources, like my rasters and vectors and such. I'll just fix this up a little bit. Um, so this particular data set has a small geographic coverage, just a couple of um, kind of coastal areas near where I live. If I bring up my layer styling panel here, we have a few different options for how to view this in 2D. So it defaults to this thing called the textured renderer. And that's when I get the actual uh, texture from the mesh and show that in that 
that 2D view. So it basically kind of mimics a, an aerial image. Um, right now, if I had a look, it's actually, let's get that out of the way. Um, it's, while it's sitting there kind of thinking, it's downloading the, those refined tiles. So the more I zoom in, it's uh, asking Q just to go off and fetch the next kind of levels of tile sets. Um, and that can take a little bit of time depending on the remote server, but you'll see as those, as those tiles start getting pulled down locally, this view gets refined. Um, and now it's gonna take a little while because I'm doing a live demo. Actually, if I bring up the, the F12, network logger, I can I can kind of see what's happening here. You can see all these requests getting fired off to get the different bits of content for that data set. So if you have never seen this before, you can get to it from F12. It gives you that kind of uh, web browser debugging tools for you of network network requests that are going on. Um, so we have a couple of options. So the default is the texture, like that, uh, basically like an aerial image. But if I change this across to the wireframe renderer, then I actually get to see the kind of structure of that, of the 3D tiles themselves. So they're all based off these triangle primitive objects um, that that texture gets applied to. Uh, so when I change to wireframe, I can actually kind of see the structure of that data of how it's been um, put together. And I can go through and I could style this using any kind of cutest symbol that I want. Um, but the other option I've got here is if I just make this a little bit less obnoxious, um, I can turn on this one here for using the texture colors. So when I do that, I should have uh, set this up before. Um, it will still show me that wireframe structure, but it will grab a representative color from the center of each texture. So I get kind of a, a mix between seeing the structure of the mesh, but also getting a bit more context than that raw mesh is giving me. I can kind of see where the parks are and the buildings are and such. Um, and this is a, a great way to kind of see as I zoom in how that content gets refined and I get a more detailed mesh gets brought in. So as I kind of zoom out, these features are simplified. Um, so the other option that we have here for the 2D view of this data is uh, this concept of the maximum error. So this one would be quite familiar to people if you've used the, the point cloud support in QGIS. It has a similar kind of option. But if I decrease this maximum error, so I'm basically saying I, I, I want you to get more detail, it will download the tiles at a greater um, zoom level. So it'll get more tiles of more detailed data to render for that view. Um, and if I push this right up, you'll notice it starts going for the, it's like, okay, well, the the zoomed out tiles are now enough for this seven millimeter error. And you can see I'm starting to get the, the lower resolution textures and the lower resolution mesh um, because I've kind of said that's that's fine for this view. But if I if I wanted a really detailed view and I don't care about my kind of network traffic, I could push this right down to um, something like this and uh, saturate my network connection. Actually, that didn't take too long. The default there is uh, moderately conservative. Uh, because this is just another 2D layer at the moment, this will work nicely in everything that I'm used to in QGIS. If I brought up a print layout, for instance, and I had a map in my print layout, um, it'll show there just like any other layer source. Um, similarly, if you were running this project on QGIS server, you'd also see that data rendered just like I, I'm seeing here. Um, or if it was even in uh, merge and maps or QField or whatever, you'd see that layer as a 2D representation of that data. Um, but the, the most interesting thing comes in when we open up a 3D scene. So if I bring up a 3D view of this data, um, and as I kind of uh, spin, this, spin this view around, you can see, you know, wow, it's actually 3D content. It's not just a 2D aerial image. Um, and again, you can see this refinement happening as I'm moving the scene around. So as I kind of zoom into different parts of the scene, it will start grabbing more detail, getting more of that the higher resolution tiles from that remote server. Um, and the content kind of snaps into, into focus as it's grabbing that, um, that more detailed data. 
But as I zoom out, I'm saying, okay, now I don't care so much about that. It's further away. I can get away with just having a lower representation of that of that building, and that's where it was using the um, the kind of generalized tiles for that for that area instead. But if I zoom right in here, I'm saying, get me the most detailed resolution you can of this of this building here. Um, all of this stuff, all of these layers work with everything else that's already in QGIS 3D. So if I went and said, okay, well, actually, let's just turn on some, some lighting effects like the iDome lighting. So now I start getting that uh, effect where it highlights the edges. You can see that works perfectly with um, the tiled scene. Actually, this is a big gap in this data set because they've got a more detailed uh, separate data set that covers that area. So that's not a bug, that's a, something in the data set itself. Um, but yeah, so that iDome lighting is working perfectly and it helps sort of bring out the edges of that, that data set, just like it does with point clouds. Um, we could also turn on the ambient inclusion, I find kind of gives it a little bit more, little bit more depth to that data set as well. Like if I, if I turn that back off, turn that on, uh, it kind of darkens the areas that would naturally be a little bit darker where they're trapped in between um, objects. Uh, you, you could turn on shadows as well and you can see that kind of works, but shadows work a bit oddly with these cesium data sets because generally when the data set is captured, it will have a shadow in the textures as well. So you can see, even though I don't have shadows turned on in my 3D view, the, the shadows are kind of an inherent part of this data set. Like when it was photographed, the, the shadows have kind of been are baked into those textures. Um, so if I turn on the QGIS just shadows, things get a little bit weird because I sort of get two shadows, one that's part of that data set and then one that's coming from QGIS drawing shadows on top of things. So works, but it depends on the data set if it actually makes any kind of sense. Um, the In the 3D view as well, the, the measure tool works really nicely with these data sets. So it has the, um, the kind of improved measure tool that came in, um, I'm gonna say, I don't know, maybe it was two releases ago. Maybe it was one release ago, I'm not sure. Um, but if I kind of wanted to say, what's the distance between the top of this, this building here and its friend across the street, um, you get this really nice thing where it, it traces array from the camera and grabs the, the part on the roof there. And so it's kind of um, gives me exactly what I'm, what I expect to see when I'm doing that measurement. Works really nicely with these tiled scenes. Um, the other thing that we've got, the other option we've got here, and I'm just going to change my data set, for example. Pull this one in. So this data set's a, a slightly different type of um, cesium 3D tile. Uh, so the ones we were looking at up to now have been these kind of um, photorealistic uh, content where it was like a 3D representation of what you'd sort of see if you're flying a plane over. Um, this is a slightly different data set in that it's one that has been built from um, BIM models of the area. So it actually has the, the structure of the, the buildings um, that have been wrapped in the textures afterwards. So it's, uh, if I view this one in 3D, the buildings, when this content loads in, um, the building edges are really sharp and the, the actual structure of them has been sort of basically taken from the original uh, CAD uh, plans of this area. Um, and it's just had photo textures wrapped onto that. Um, you can see this one here, it's actually floating above the base map by a couple of hundred meters. And that's because uh, at the moment, my 3D scene is set to have a terrain at zero meters. But this data set, this area is actually um, a couple of hundred meters elevation. Um, so what I wanted to show here is in my, my layer properties, let me just force this one on top. Um, we have this elevation tab 
like we do for point clouds and for um, other freely data sets in QGIS. And so I could go in here and I could actually change this offset and pull this back down to sort of make it sit nicely on that uh, on that ground level. I think I went a little bit too far there. Um, so that's one another option we have for these tiled scenes. You can kind of manually tweak the elevation by changing the the scale and the offset until it fits nicely with the other data sets that you've got in your um, in your map view. Um, what else was I going to show? Let me just check in my um, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be stuck on my screen. Okay, a couple of things to know. Uh, let me bring this back up. This is the this is like the my FAQ in advance, I guess you'd say. Um, so number one is if you're trying to load 3D content, like a 3D Cesium 3D tile set into QGIS, and you're not seeing anything in the 3D view or in the 2D view. Uh, try zooming in. Uh, and the reason is sometimes these data sets, when the person who has made them has set up the tile structure and the zoom levels and such, they've made it that it's not visible from a very zoomed out uh, level. And you have to actually zoom in before that content will start snapping into view. So that's my number one piece of advice. If you're not seeing anything, try zooming in. Um, number two is set the scene limits in your QGIS project if you're opening up a 3D data set and you know that it's got a really large geographic coverage. So this is especially true for like the Google Earth tiles or for something like the cesium ion OSM buildings data sets. Um, let me just show you how that is done. So if I was to oops if I was to make a quick project with OpenStreetMap and uh, the Google Earth tiles. Um, actually, here's a good example as well. So I don't see anything initially until I zoom in. Actually, I do see something and it's really weird. Ignore that. Um, I don't see anything until I zoom into my project uh, and I'll start to see the content will snap in as I get closer to um, uh, you know, a, a more zoomed in level. Um, if I was to try and make a 3D view of this right now, this Google Earth data set is a global data set. It's gonna try and make a 3D view of a massive geographic region and it does not work well in QGIS. So the, the trick to handle this nicely is to go into your project properties. Um, under this view settings tab, you can set the project full extent. So right now it's saying I don't have a full extent it's the extent of all my data sets which are global so i'm going to override this and say this map can this view right now is the project extent um, and what that means is if i hit the full extent button that's what it's going to take me out to that's kind of the limits of this project uh, but also when i make a 3d view that's also becomes the limits of that 3d view and it means that um, this data set has a lot less content that it's trying to load, uh, a lot smaller geographic region, means that things just work better in the QGIS 3D view. Um, and we can see here some nice nice 3D tiles coming from Google Earth in this case. Uh, what was my next? So, there, so set the scene limits. So for the project properties, view extent, uh, that'll give you a better performance in the QGIS 3D view. Uh, lastly, some data sets uh, are really bad. So in our testing of this, we came across like every sort of cesium 3D tiles data set we could find out there in the wild. And there's a lot out there that have been made by some tools that are giving bad outputs. So some of them have got incorrect uh, georeferencing and they'll come up in the wrong part of the earth and there's kind of nothing you can do about that. It's been, it's the data set itself is wrong. Um, some of them have been designed without uh, many levels of zoom and it's kind of you get one one zoom level for the whole region and then as soon as you zoom in it gets these tiny little tiles like thousands and thousands of tiles that it has to load to actually cover any area um, and they take forever to kind of load in and you see your, your network just sitting there grabbing all these tiles grabbing all these tiles um, and unfortunately it's actually the data set itself has not been made in the best way in that case like instead of taking advantage of this structure that 
the Freddy tiles have been designed for, where you have lots of zoom levels and the kind of more you zoom in, you're getting little bits of the data just given to you a chunk at a time. Um, there's just some really bad data out there. Uh, that said, our philosophy with QGIS is to be as accepting as possible with data sets. So we don't reject those data sets and say, no, nah, you can't load that one in full stop. We have made it so as many of those data sets as possible will still load in. The performance might be bad. They might look like they're in the wrong area in the globe or whatever, but you can still get that data and you can still look at it and you can still see it. And QGIS is being as forgiving as it possibly can. Um, oh, okay. So before I get to this, uh, the, there's something else off my notes. Um, one other thing that we did alongside the working QGIS itself is we also released a plugin for, for Cesium Ion. So this, if you look in your QGIS 3.34 plugin manager and you search for Cesium, you'll come across this plugin, the Cesium Ion plugin. And this one has been made to make it really easy to get content from that Cesium Ion platform. So that's the, again, Cesium's kind of data hosting, uh, data processing service. Um, when you have that plugin installed, you'll get a new entry in your QGIS browser panel for Cesium Ion. And if I open this up, um, these are the data sets I've got in my Cesium Ion account. I can go ahead and let's get rid of Google tiles here. I could go ahead and load one of these in. Let's say this Boston one looks really cool. Um, the, the plugin basically takes you through this whole process of creating a token to access that data set that gets embedded into that project. So it makes a, a token that's project specific um, that you can then share with somebody else and they don't actually need their own Cesium Ion account to access that data set. So this has been designed um, to match the behavior of the, the Cesium Ion add-ins for Unity and Unreal and, and all the other ones that Cesium has got these native integrations with. Um, so if I bring this one in, oh, I think this project has still got that. Let's fix that. Uh, I could then share this project with someone else and they wouldn't need a Cesium Ion account. They're still using my access token. So it kind of gets associated back to my account for the usage terms, but there's a token that I could revoke myself at a later stage if I wanted to. Um, but it makes it makes it really easy to, to get these Cesium Ion data sets into QGIS. Let's turn off that. Um, and some of them look great, like this one. Okay, cool. Uh, where was I? What's next? Okay, so this is, um, everything that's available for QGIS 3.34 in a couple of weeks time. There is a bunch of stuff that we would love to tackle as the kind of stage two of, uh, of Cesium 3D tiles and QGIS. So the, the big ticket item that um, will be next on our list is attribute handling. And what I mean by that is there's a whole use case for these 3D tiles that come from the, the BIM side of things where you can have attributes associated with parts of the 3D model. So you could have information about uh, the materials used by a wall or the materials used by a floor or a door and such. Um, and the 3D tiles format has capability of storing all that. Currently we don't, we can't access that through QGIS. So that would be our, you know, our kind of big ticket item. We'd love to be able to expose that information so you could use your identify tool and kind of query those data sets and get that information that's attached to the, the different parts of those models. Um, on a similar kind of vein, uh, more styling options. So right now we've got a couple of options for the 2D styling of, um, of the tiled scenes. Uh, 3D, you just get the photorealistic mesh is the only option you get. Um, and if the data set doesn't have textures, then you get it in a nice, lovely gray color. Uh, whereas we would like to be able to do things like this that you can do on the Cesium um, JavaScript library, where you can uh, have material defined by those attributes. So you could start getting in and actually start doing like a, almost like a categorized renderer of the, the data set by a different attribute or by different, by height or something like that. Uh, we would definitely love to integrate it with the elevation profile tool that we've been working on over the last couple of years. Um, right now it isn't, so you can't draw your line across a cross section across a 
3D tiles data set and see like you can with point clouds, that would be another really high ticket item that we'd love to do in future. Uh, and then lastly, pulling some tools into the processing toolbox for working with 3D tiles. Um, there actually is some in QGIS 3.34. You get some tools for converting parts of 3D tile spec, like the GLTF format into a standard vector layer, like a geo package. Um, but there's a lot more tools that we'd love to be able to expose here that would mean that you could kind of get data sets from a, from a 3D tiles format and pull it in as a vector file and start using all your other standard processing um, analysis tools on that. Um, lastly, there's some opportunities to make things faster as well. So there is um, some optimizations that we kind of identified as part of this work, but we were like, no, that's stage two. That's not, that's definitely not stage one, um, but there is opportunities to make things even faster and better. And that's when I throw across the questions. Brilliant stuff. Thanks so much, Niall. Um, this is fantastic. I really love the, um, you know, how I was the global data set from Google, you know, because a lot of areas don't have that great representation um, of, you know, 3D data. I know, especially for, um, I'm in South Africa, so I would probably struggle to get quite a bit of 3D data outside of our main cities. So I'm very, very keen to to try this out and, and see, you know, what we can do with this. I, all I can think of in, in my mind is this kind of looks like a video game. This is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was talking to someone recently actually about this and it it, it kind of um I love this thing because it resonates with me and that that kid in me who used to play with like uh, models of things and like when I was a kid it was like my dream job was uh, I'd be that person who goes into a museum and makes like a 3D model of a national park or something with those little buildings or like a oh, yeah you know, a 3D diorama. model of like an architecture thing and got little trees and I was like oh that'd be cool this job ever and this is kind of like the closest I've got to it is like playing with this um these 3D tiles data sets so I'm like yeah it's good it's cool Brilliant stuff. Already um, on the YouTube live chat, we've got a bunch of people um, saying hi from all over the world, um, from Switzerland, from Andres. We have someone coming in from Bhutan. Hi, Jigmi. Uh, we've got um, people coming in from Sardinia, Ghana, Australia. So really, there's great coverage. And thank you to everyone for saying hi from where you're from. All righty. Um, ooh, even Malaysia. So the first question is from Andreas. Um, they ask for the Google data, do you need a Google API key to access that data? Yeah, you do, but at the moment it's free. So you can go onto the Google admin console, Google developer console. Uh, it's kind of a little bit hidden, but um, you, you go into the Google developer something and you can sign up, you enable the Maps API and you get your API key. Uh, Right now, free, you can use it as much as you want. Um, you know, fingers crossed it remains free. <laughs> uh, the scary bit there is that I think you need to enter your card details, uh, but they are not going to charge you. Uh, it's just kind of proof that uh, you're serious. I am a human. <laughs> All right, I see um, Christian says, thanks for the awesome presentation. Great work. Looking forward to testing it. And then, oh, just saw Hey, actually, came can, I just, yes. can I just add on that, on that Google Earth topic? I'd be cautious mm -hmm. if you added a Google Earth data set to your project using your API key, sharing that project with someone else, because they'll also be using your API key. So just be cautious. Okay, okay. And I mean, obviously, I always sort of hop into the realm of attribution, et cetera, because it's especially tricky with, you know, data that's free or data that, you know, is freely available. Um, how do we go about with Google and also with Cesium? Because I think that's also a great um, data um, resource. How do you go about, you know, doing the correct attribution and stuff? Is it on the site? Can people just copy out, a, you know, an attribution there? Yeah, it is on, when you go to that Google Maps or the Google admin console thing and you enable that key, it gives you the uh, copyright attribution string thing that you're supposed to use there. Um, it is, it's a, it's not forced on you, you know, it says you've got to do this, but uh, it's up to you to do that. 
and kind of abide by that. Much like OpenStreetMap, you know, you can anyone can put an OpenStreetMap data set in their project without attributing it, but uh, you're supposed to. <laughs> Yeah, um, no. It, 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 it's actually um, one of the unfortunate things I think is right now that the cesium freely tile specification doesn't have a uh, metadata, like a spatial metadata structure. So, you know, I'd, I'd hope like maybe in version, future version of that specification, they'd actually put that in there. And then as part of that data set, it could have that copyright string and we could grab it in QGIS and say, okay, let's just put this straight away in the project and just sort of take away that responsibility from, from the user. Fingers crossed, Brilliant. future, you know, that would, that would be fantastic. That would be ideal. Um, I see, hi, Admire, um, someone else re representing from South Africa. So Admire asks, um, can you share the list of URL for the tiled scenes? You're muted now. <laughs> Just both of you are now muted. <laughs> Hang on. I was going to say, I, I actually, I don't know the best way to, to get that out to people. So I'm going to send it to you, Amy, and you can work out the best way to get that out. Perfect. To I'll put it on the wiki. Um, I think that's probably best. That's, you know, sort of where I just pop all the open day information, but I think it would also. And, and, and I won't, I won't include my Google Earth one. <laughs> Now, I'll also put it in the description of this video. I think that'll also be great. Mm. All right, um, Christian. Um, I keep wanting to say Christian. I offer can't swear of saying it. Anyway, um, are the 3D models uh, that also have indoor data on the Cesium platform? So is there indoor um, mapping happening? Um, would it technically be possible to go into a building in QGIS or in Cesium 3D? Is this possible? um in 3d tiles uh yes it's possible yes it's possible in the QGIS 3d view uh no it's not really possible in the QGIS 2d view because the 2d view gives you a what is it plus or minus a thousand meters is that what we said all along it's kind of slice through the the top of the globe um there, so that that should have been in my future list as well is uh, uh this ability to do an elevation slice in the QGIS 2D view mm -hmm. would be useful for this and for point clouds as well. And actually say, you know, just give me this floor of the data. Give me mm -hmm. this, you know, this range from 10 meters to 15 meters or whatever and slice through that. Um, mm -hmm. But in the 3D view, you can walk inside. If the data set had it, you could walk inside a building and see bits inside that building. Because mm. I know indoor mapping is becoming quite popular and I know QGIS has all of this sort of um, ability to do that. I mean, we're, there were quite a lot of talks at the recent ICC conference in Cape Town about, you know, 3D mapping and indoor mapping. Um, so it's really nice to see this coming through. So are, are we able to do that with 3D tiles, I think, in, in general? Yeah, well, that that's why, um, you know, there's a, a BIM use case for this. So like mm -hmm. that, uh, that kind of CAD um, integration thing with GIS through the that catchphrase of BIM. Um, this is actually the closest I've seen of an actual real world working application of BIM in, is the 3D, Cesium 3D tiles, um, where it's sort of progressed from just being a marketing catchphrase to something that's actually like a concrete product that you mm -hmm. can see. Um, so some of the some of the Australian data sets that I've been playing with have actually got like a that kind of BIM concept where you can you can go into some select buildings and uh, query different parts of them and say, okay, what's this wall made of? And you get the whole detail and you kind of, what's this wall made of? And it's got all that um, that information attached to different parts of that model. So that's just the things that we would like to be able to tackle mm -hmm. in sort of a future round where we actually be able to expose that, those attribute information um, into, into QGIS. Brilliant. All right. So um, Kuko from Ghana asks, um, what formats are we able to export this in and how can we export? Uh, so you can export it into PDF. <laughs> <laughs> you can export it into a TIFF. No, um, so, so you can export your 2D views into any of the formats that you can, a normal QGIS uh, layer. 
uh, you can't say right click on a tiled scene layer and say save as geo package. Um, there, like I mentioned before, there's a processing tool that lets you do some of that, um, but it's quite a low level tool right now. So you have to have downloaded some of the, the Frida tiles offline first and then be able to convert that content into a standard shape file, geo package, whatever. Um, so again, like a, a future round, I'd like to see uh, some tools added that would actually let you say, okay, here's my here's my tiled scene, here's an extent, and here's the kind of scale that I want it, and get that content and save it out as a geo package, as a shape file. Um, but right now, yeah, you, you're kind of limited to the exporting the views of that data. All righty. One last question. I am quite aware of time. I have another session to pop into and prep. Um, so there is one last question from Andreas. Um, in the future of QGIS, it, it would also be great to have a globe interface for such cesium data. So instead of a projected 3D scene, you could have a, a globe interface. I think that's more of a comment than a question. <laughs> that's a good one for my. Yeah, absolutely. Like, that has been, um, I would hope, from the beginning to have also the globe representation. Um, I it, it most likely it will come someday, but uh, like at least uh, until this point, we were typically dealing just with like sm uh, smaller scenes. So I don't know, up to a few hundred kilometers wide, let's say. And there um, it was fine to, to have just this flat area, but yeah. The, the globe would be would be great. Uh, there are some technical issues with it right now, so that's why it's uh, just uh, the flat Earth. Alrighty, so um, we can look forward to it in the future. <laughs> yeah, and uh, if we have a bit of time, I have maybe like two more comments to to say, um, some hints. So with um, vertical alignment of data sets. So Niall has already mentioned that there is the option to use uh, offset. Um, just uh, one thing that like. Um, the um, 3D tiles uh, data sets, they use uh, ellipsoid elevations. And so if you are dealing with some data that are, let's say, close to sea level uh, in ellipsoid elevations, it's typically like somewhere like minus 50 meters or something like that um, because it's ellipsoid elevation. And so it can happen that you load a, a, a tiled scene layer and actually you don't see anything because everything is um, like, like the, the flat terrain that you get by default at the elevation zero is on top of your actual data. So you may also want to, as Nile um, had that you either like turn off the uh, default terrain completely, or you just like try to elevate um, uh, your data um, with some plus offset. And um, one more thing I wanted to mention that the, this cesium ion um, service that uh, Niall mentioned is really quite a nice tool. Like if you have some uh, 3D data, uh, 3D models of your own, let's say some Colada models or like uh, OBJ or PLY, these common formats, um, it's a very easy or like the easiest way to just um, uh, drop it there into the service. To, to get this, um, uh, these 3D tiles um, uh, generated that you can immediately use in QGIS and they have quite a generous uh, free um, uh, plan. So uh, it's uh, worth giving it a try. And maybe the, the last bit I wanted to say, uh, just uh, like a technical note, that um, in QGIS right now what we support is the um, uh, 3D tiles at version 1.0. There is also a, a slightly updated standard, which is uh, version 1.1, and we support few features out of that, uh, but uh, just few of them. So it, it could be also the case that you encounter some data sets that are maybe for this new version, and uh, we are unable to, to handle those. Um, we would also love to maybe hear from you and uh, like, uh, get the chance to see those data sets um, and uh, possibly add the support for those as well. And yeah, I guess uh, that's it for me. Just wanted to say that it was like a lot of fun to to work on this. Um, as Niall was saying, it's uh, really like this um, twin 
models of um, of the world it's cool and so thanks to cesium for both like working hard on the on these specs that can be used by everyone and uh, like contributing to open source and also like con um, providing financial support for uh, projects like this yeah definitely and also uh, big thanks to kevin from cesium as well who was like our, uh, our go-to expert whenever we had questions about the format and he was just like smash it out with an answer that was right to the point. So yeah, thanks, Kevin. Brilliant stuff. All right, thank you all. I'm going to um, bring the session to a close. Thank you for everybody who did um, attend. Uh, there's still a couple of questions going through the live chat. So hopefully you can experiment um, with the 3D tiles a bit and see exactly what you can do because you should be able to export things in the general manner that you usually export um, in QGIS. Um, so yeah, have a good test out. And I want to just thank um, Martin and Nile for giving us such a fantastic um, presentation. I'm really excited to try out this functionality in the um, new release. So thank you to you both. And hopefully we will see you soon on QGIS Open Day. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Bye -bye.